The Witchcraft of Ulua Sabmon the Anchorite was famed no less for his piety than for his prophetic wisdom and knowledge of the dark art of sorcery. He had dwelt alone for two generations in a curious house on the rim of the northern desert of Tassoon, a house whose floor and walls were built from the large bones of dromedaries, and whose roof was a wattling composed of the smaller bones of wild dogs and men and hyenas. These ossuary relics, chosen for their whiteness and symmetry, were bound securely together with well-tanned thongs, and were joined and fitted with marvelous closeness, leaving no space for the blown sand to penetrate. This house was the pride of Sabmon, who swept it daily with a besom of mummy's hair, till it shone immaculate as polished ivory, both within and without. Despite his remoteness and reclusion, and the hardships that attended a journey to his abode, Sabmon was much consulted by the people of Tassun, and was even sought by pilgrims from the further shores of Zathik. However, though not ungracious or inhospitable, he often ignored the queries of his visitors, who, as a rule, wished merely to divine the future or to ask advice concerning the most advantageous government of their temporal affairs. He became more and more taciturn with age, and spoke little with men in his last years. It was said, perhaps not untruly, that he preferred to talk with the ever-murmuring palms about his well, or the desert-wandering stars that went over his hermitage. In the summer of Sabmon's ninety-third year, there came to him the youth Amelzane, his great-nephew, and the son of a niece that Sabmon had loved dearly in days before his retirement to a gymnosophic seclusion. Amelzane, who had spent all of his one and twenty years in the upland home of his parents, was on his way to Mirab, the capital of Tassun, where he would serve as a cupbearer to Famorg the king. This post, obtained for him by influential friends of his father, was much coveted among the youth of the land, and would lead to high advancement if he were fortunate enough to win the king's favor. In accord with his mother's wish, he had come to visit Sabmon and to ask the counsel of the sage regarding various problems of worldly conduct. Sabmon, whose eyes were undimmed by age and astronomy and much poring over volumes of archaic ciphers, was pleased with Amelzane and found in the boy something of his mother's beauty and for this reason he gave freely of his hoarded wisdom. And after uttering many profound and pertinent maxims, he said to Amelzane, It is indeed well that you have come to me, for, innocent of the world's turpitude, you fare to a city of strange sins and strange witcheries and sorceries. There are numerous evils in Mirab. Its women are witches and harlots, and their beauty is a foulness, wherein the young, the strong, the valiant, are limed and taken. Then, ere Amelzane departed, Sabmon gave to him a small amulet of silver, graven curiously with the mignard skeleton of a girl. And Sabmon said, I counsel you to wear this amulet at all times henceforward. It contains a pinch of ashes from the pyre of Yosebni, sage and archmage, who won supremacy over men and demons in elder years by defying all mortal temptation and putting down the insubordination of the flesh. There is a virtue in these ashes, and they will protect you from such evils as were overcome by Yosebni. And yet, Peradventure, there are ills and enchantments in Mirab from which the amulet cannot defend you. In such case, you must return to me. I shall watch over you carefully, and shall know all that occurs to you in Mirab, for I have long since become the owner of a certain rare faculties of sight and hearing whose exercise is not debarred or limited by mere distance. Amelzane, being ignorant of the matters at which Sabmon hinted, was somewhat bewildered by this peroration. But he received the amulet gratefully, 
Then, bidding Sabmon a reverential farewell, he resumed his journey to Mirab, wondering much as to the fortune that would befall him in that sinful and many-legended city. 2. Famorg, who had grown old and senile amid his debaucheries, was the ruler of an aging, semi-desert land, and his court was a place of far-sought luxury, of obliquitous refinement and corruption. The youth Amalzane, accustomed only to the simple manners, the rude virtues and vices of country-dwelling folk, was dazzled at first by the sybaritic life around him. But a certain innate strength of character, fortified by the moral teachings of his parents, and the precepts of his great-uncle Sabmon preserved him from any grave errors or lapses. Thus it was that he served as a cup-bearer at Bacchanalian revels, but remained abstemious throughout, pouring night after night in the ruby-crusted cup of Famorg the maddening wines that were drugged with cannabis and the stupefying arrack with its infusion of poppy. With untainted heart and flesh, he beheld the infamous mummeries whereby the courtiers, vying with each other in shamelessness, attempted to lighten the king's ennui. Feeling only wonder or disgust, he watched the nimble and lascivious contortions of black dancers from Duzathom in the north, or saffron-bodied girls from the southern isles. His parents, who believed implicitly in the superhuman goodness of monarchs, had not prepared him for this spectacle of royal vice. But the reverence they had instilled so thoroughly into Amalzane led him to regard it all as being the peculiar but mysterious prerogative of the kings of Tassoon. During his first month in Mirab, Amalzane heard much of the Princess Ulua, sole daughter of Famorg and Queen Lunalia. But since the women of the royal family seldom attended the banquets or appeared in public, he did not see her. The huge and shadowy palace, however, was filled with whispers concerning her amours. Ulua, he was told, had inherited the sorceries of her mother Lunalia, whose dark, luxurious beauty, so often sung by bewitched poets, was now fallen to a haggish decrepitude. The lovers of Ulua were innumerable, and she often procured their passion or ensured their fidelity by other charms than those of her person. Though little taller than a child, she was exquisitely formed and endowed with the loveliness of some female demon that might haunt the slumbers of youth. She was feared by many, and her ill will was deemed a dangerous thing. Famorg, no less blind to her sins and witcheries than he had been to those of Lunalia, indulged her in all ways and denied her nothing. Amalzane's duties left him much idle time for Famorg usually slept the double sleep of age and intoxication after the evening revels. Much of this time he gave to the study of algebra and the reading of olden poems and romances. One morning, while he was engaged with certain algebraic calculations, there came to Amalzane a huge negress who had been pointed out to him as one of Ulua's waiting women. She told him peremptorily that he was to follow her to the apartments of Ulua. Bewildered and amazed by this singular interruption of his studies, he was unable to reply for a moment. Thereupon, seeing his hesitation, the great black woman lifted him in her naked arms and carried him easily from the room and through the palace halls. Angry and full of discomfiture, he found himself deposited in a chamber hung with shameless designs, where, amid the fuming of aphrodisiac vapors, the princess regarded him with luxurious gravity from a couch of fire-bright scarlet. She was small as a woman of the elf folk, and voluptuous as a coiled lamia. The incense floated about her like sinuous veils. There are other things than the pouring of wine for a sottish monarch, or the study of worm-eaten volumes, said Ulua, in a voice that was like the flowing of hot honey. Sir Cupbearer, your youth should have a better employment than these. I ask no employment other than my duties and studies, replied Amalzane ungraciously. But tell me, O princess, what is your will? Why has your serving woman brought me here in a fashion so unseemly? For a youth so erudite and clever, 
The question should be needless, answered Ulua, smiling obliquely. See you not that I am beautiful and desirable? Behold, my arms are the portals of strange felicities. The pleasures I give are keener than the pangs of a fiery death. The dead kings of Tassoon will whisper enviously of our love to their dead queens in the immemorial granite vaults below Kaon Gaka. The Sidon, the black shadowy lord of hell grown jealous of our raptures, will wish to become incarnate in a mortal body. The vapors, mounting thickly from golden thuribles before the couch, were parted with a motion as of drawn draperies, and Amalzane saw that Ulua was clad only in breast cups of coral and mother of pearl, and bracelets and anklets of jet. The matters whereof you speak are nothing to me, said the youth, untempted. Ulua laughed lightly, and the vapors undulated as if in unison with her laughter, and were shaped dimly into obscene forms. Soon you will answer otherwise, she told the youth. Few men have denied me long, and these few have regretted their refusal in the end. You may go now, but you will return to me presently, of your own accord. For many days thereafter, Amalzane, going about his duties as usual, was aware of a strange haunting. It seemed now that Ulua was everywhere. Appearing at the revels as if by some new caprice, she flaunted her evil beauty in the eyes of the young cupbearer, and often, by day, he met her in the palace gardens and corridors. All men spoke of her, as if conspiring tacitly to keep her in his thoughts, and it seemed that even the heavy arises whispered her name as they rustled in the lost winds that wandered through the gloomy and interminable halls. This, however, was not all, for her undesired image began to trouble his nightly dreams, and awakening, he heard the warm, dulcet languor of her voice, and felt the caress of light and subtle fingers in the darkness. Peering at the pale moon that waxed beyond the windows, above the black cypresses, he saw her dead, corroded face assume the living features of Ulua. The lithe and minyard forms of the young witch appeared to move among the fabulous queens and goddesses that thronged the opulent hangings with their amours. Beheld as if through enchantment, her face leaned beside his in the mirrors, and she came and vanished phantom-like with seductive murmurs and wanton gestures as he bent over his books. But though he was perturbed by these appearances, in which he could scarce distinguish the real from the illusory, Amalzane was still indifferent toward Ulua, being surely protected from her charms by the amulet containing the ashes of Yos Ebni, saint and sage and archmage. From certain curious flavors detected more than once in his food and drink, he suspected that the love potions for which he had become infamous were being administered to him. But beyond a light and passing qualmishness, he experienced no ill effect whatever, and he was wholly ignorant of the spells woven against him in secret, and the thrice-lethal involtuations that were designed to wound his heart and senses. Now, though he knew it not, his indifference was a matter of much gossip at the court. Men marveled greatly at such exemption, for all whom the princess had chosen heretofore, whether captains, cup-bearers, or high dignitaries, or common soldiers and grooms, had yielded easily to her bewitchments. So it came to pass that Ulua was angered, since all men knew that her beauty was scorned by Amalzane, and her sorcery was impotent to ensnare him. Thereupon she ceased to appear at the revels of Fomorg, and Amalzane beheld her no longer in the halls and gardens, and neither his dreams nor his waking hours were haunted any more by the spell-wrought semblance of Ulua. So, in his innocence, he rejoiced as one who has encountered a grave peril and has come forth unharmed. Then, later, on a certain night, as he lay sleeping tranquilly in the moonless hours before dawn, 
there came to him in his dream a figure muffled from crown to heel with the vestments of the tomb. Tall as a caryatid, awful and menacing, it leaned above him in silence more malignant than any curse, and the sermons fell open at the breast, and charnel worms and death scarabs and scorpions, together with shreds of rotting flesh, rained down upon Amal Zane. Then, as he awoke from his nightmare, sick and stifled, he breathed a carrion fetter, and felt against him the pressure of a still, heavy body. Affrighted, he rose and lit the lamp, but the bed was empty. Yet the odor of putrefaction still lingered, and Amalzane could have sworn that the corpse of a woman, two weeks dead and teeming with maggots, had lain closely at his side in the darkness. Thereafter, for many nights, his slumbers were broken by such foulnesses as this. Hardly could he sleep at all for the horror of that which came and went, invisible but palpable, in his chamber. Always he awoke from ill dreams, to find about him the stiffened arms of long-dead succubi, or to feel at his side the amorous trembling of fleshless skeletons. He was choked by the natron and bitumen of mummied breasts. He was crushed by the unremoving weight of gigantic liches. He was kissed nauseously by lips that were oozing tatters of corruption. Nor was this all. For other abominations came to him by day, visible and perceived through all his senses, and more loathsome even than the dead. Things that seemed as the leavings of leprosy crawled before him at high noon in the halls of Famorg, and they rose up from the shadows and sidled toward him, leering whitely with faces that were no longer faces, and trying to caress him with their half-eaten fingers. About his ankles, as he went to and fro, there clung lascivious empusai with breasts that were furred like the bat, and serpent-bodied lamiae minced and pirouetted before his eyes, like the dancers before the king. No longer could he read his books or solve his problems of algebra in peace, for the letters changed from moment to moment beneath his scrutiny, and were twisted into runes of evil meaning, and the signs and ciphers he had written were turned into devils no bigger than large emmets, that writhed foully across the paper as if on a field, performing those rites which are acceptable only to Alila, queen of perdition and goddess of all iniquities. Thus plagued and bedeviled, the youth Amalzane was near to madness, yet he dared not complain or speak to others of aught that he beheld, for he knew that these horrors, whether immaterial or substantial, were perceived only by himself. Nightly, for the full period of a moon, he lay with dead things in his chamber, and daily, in all his comings and goings, he was besought by abhorrent specters. And he doubted not that all these were the sendings of Ulua, angered by his refusal of her love. And he remembered that Sabmon had hinted darkly of certain enchantments from which the ashes of Yos Ebni, preserved in the silver amulet, might be powerless to defend him. And knowing that such enchantments were upon him now, he recalled the final injunction of the old archmage. So, feeling that there was no help for him save in the wizardry of Sabmon, he went before King Famorg and begged a short leave of absence from the court. And Famorg, who was well pleased with the cupbearer and, moreover, had begun to note his thinness and pallor, granted the request readily. Mounted on a palfrey chosen for speed and endurance, Amalzane rode northward from Mirab on a sultry morning in autumn. A strange heaviness had stilled all the air, and great coppery clouds were piled like towering, many-domed palaces of genii on the desert hills. The sun appeared to swim in molten brass. No vultures flew on the silent heavens, and the very jackals had retired to their lairs, as if in fear of some unknown doom. But Amalzane, riding swiftly toward Sabmon's hermitage, was haunted still by leprous larvae that rose before him, posturing foully on the dun sands, and he heard the desirous moaning of succubi under the hooves of his horse. The night waylaid him, 
airless and starless, as he came to a well amid dying palms. Here he lay sleepless, with the curse of Ulua still upon him, for it seemed that the dry, dusty liches of desert tombs reclined rigidly at his side, and bony fingers wooed him toward the unfathomable sand pits from which they had risen. Weary and devil-ridden, he reached the wattled house of Sabmon at noon of the next day. The sage greeted him affectionately, showing no surprise, and listened to his story with the air of one who hearkens a twice-told tale. These things and more were known to me from the beginning, he said to Amalzane. I could have saved you from the sendings of Ulua ere now, but it was my wish that you should come to me at this time, forsaking the court of the dotard Famorg and the evil city of Mirab, whose iniquities are now at the full. The imminent doom of Mirab, though unread by her astrologers, has been declared in the heavens, and I would not that you should share the doom. It is needful, he went on, that the spells of Ulua should be broken on this very day, and the sendings return to her that sent them, since otherwise they would haunt you forever remaining as a visible and tangible plague when the witch herself has gone to her black lord, Thessidon, in the seventh hell. Then, to the wonderment of Amalzane, the old magician brought forth from a cabinet of ivory an elliptic mirror of dark and burnished metal and placed it before him. The mirror was held aloft by the muffled hands of a veiled image, and peering within it, Amalzane saw neither his own face, nor the face of Sabmon, nor aught of the room itself reflected. And Sabmon enjoined him to watch the mirror closely, and then repaired to a small oratory that was curtained off from the chamber with long and queerly painted rolls of camel parchment. Watching the mirror, Amalzane was aware that certain of the sendings of Ulua still came and went beside him, striving ever to gain his attention with unclean gestures such as harlots use. But resolutely he fixed his eyes on the void and unreflecting metal, and anon he heard the voice of Sabmon chanting without pause the powerful words of an antique formula of exorcism. And now from between the oratory curtains there issued the intolerable pungency of burning spices, such as are employed to drive away demons. Then Amalzane perceived, without lifting his eyes from the mirror, that the sendings of Ulua had all vanished like vapors blown away by the desert wind. But in the mirror a scene limbed itself darkly, and he seemed to look on the marble towers of the city of Mirab beneath overlooming bastions of ominous cloud. Then the scene shifted, and he saw the palace hall where Famorg nodded in wine-stained purple senile and drunken, amid his ministers and sycophants. Again the mirror changed, and he beheld a room with tapestries of shameless design, where, on a couch of fire-bright crimson, the princess Ulua sat with her latest lovers amid the fuming of golden thuribles. Marveling as he peered within the mirror, Amalzane witnessed a strange thing, for the vapors of the thuribles, mounting thickly and voluminously, took from instant to instant the form of those very apparitions by which he had been bedeviled so long. Ever they rose and multiplied, till the chamber teemed with the spawn of hell and the vomitings of the riven charnel. Betwixt Ulua and the lover at her right hand, who was a captain of the king's guard, there coiled a monstrous lamia, enfolding them both in its serpentine volumes and crushing them with its human bosom, and close at her left hand appeared a half-eaten corpse, leering with lipless teeth, from whose cerements worms were sifted upon Ulua and her second lover, who was a royal equerry. And smelling like the fumes of some witch's vat, those other abominations pressed about the couch of Ulua with obscene mouthings and fingerings. At this, like the mark of a hellish branding, horror was printed on the features of the captain and the equerry, and a terror rose in the eyes of Ulua like a pale flame ignited in sunless pits, 
and her breasts shuddered beneath the breast cups. And now, in a trice, the mirrored room began to rock violently, and the censers were overturned on the tilting flags, and the shameless hanging shook and bellied like the blown sails of a vessel in storm. Great cracks appeared in the floor, and beside the couch of Ulua a chasm deepened swiftly, and then widened from wall to wall. The whole chamber was riven asunder, and the princess and her two lovers, with all her loathly sendings about them, were hurled tumultuously into the chasm. After that the mirror darkened, and Amalzane beheld for a moment the pale towers of Mirab, tossing and falling on heavens black as adamant. The mirror itself trembled, and the veiled image of metal supporting it began to totter and seemed about to fall, and the wattled house of Sabmon shook in the passing earthquake. But, being stoutly built, stood firm while the mansions and palaces of Mirab went down in ruin. When the earth had ceased its long trembling, Sabmon issued from the oratory. It is needless to moralize on what has happened, he said. You have learned the true nature of carnal desire, and have likewise beheld the history of mundane corruption. Now, being wise, you will turn early to those things which are incorruptible and beyond the world. Thereafter, till the death of Sabmon, Amalzane dwelt with him and became his only pupil in the science of the stars and the hidden arts of enchantment and sorcery.